With the announcement that Season 3 of The Witcher would be Henry Cavill's last time playing Geralt of Rivia, and it being reported that a number of writers for The Witcher show didn't like the source material and actively mocked it, The Witcher spin-off Blood Origin could not have dropped at a worse time. The fanbase had already started to become disillusioned after a dip in quality during the show's second season. Cavill's departure and the news of the writer's room brought the public opinion of Netflix's adaptation to an all-time low. Witcher Blood Origin was released at the height of this discontent, and became the vehicle for unhappy fans fans to take out their frustration on. It has become Netflix's lowest rated original ever, and that is saying something because Netflix has had some stinkers. Receiving a paltry 13% audience score, I couldn't help but wonder, is it really that bad? I feel my experience with Blood Origin was similar to my experience with the original Suicide Squad back in the yonder year of 2016. I remember when Suicide Squad was released, and everyone was talking about how garbage of a movie it was, and I thought to myself, it can't possibly be that bad. Right? They've got the Joker in this. There's no way they can possibly screw up the Joker. They even have a real life crazy person playing him, adding a level of authenticity to the role. And then I saw the movie. To put it mildly, the original Suicide Squad is an unmitigated disaster that fails to tell a coherent narrative and acts better as background footage to play random pop songs over than it does a movie. Similarly, going into Witcher Blood Origin, I thought how bad can it actually be? My investigative mind wanted to know two things. Just how bad is it? And is it deserving of its position as Netflix's lowest rated show? With these questions at the forefront of my mind, I braved the trenches and pressed play on episode one. Now before we get into the details of what I saw, I think I should first give context to my background with The Witcher. Unlike some other properties that I have been invested in for years and consumed every version of media that I can get my hands on, when it comes to The Witcher, I am little more than a filthy casual. I've seen the first two seasons of the Netflix adaptation, but have only read the first book in Sapkowski's series. I have never played any of the video games, but have watched bits and pieces of playthroughs of The Witcher 3. Just out of curiosity, why do they call you Madman? That's why. As a result of my surface level exposure to the series, I am unable to discuss how the decisions made in Blood Origin contradict the lore. From the discourse I have seen online, this seems to be the case, however I lack the background to discuss this in depth. I offer my perspective to show how Blood Origin is being received by those less well versed in the world. With all that said, The Witcher Blood Origin is a bad show. It fails some of the most basic rules of storytelling, leaving us with a poorly written, generic fantasy story that thinks it is more clever than it actually is. It also possesses some quirks that make it feel like a parody at times, robbing it of any gravitas that it's trying to achieve. I'm going to break down some of the biggest issues of the show, but I feel like fully diving into the minutia is almost pointless as the project feels half finished and flawed since its inception. With that said, I will be bringing up some spoilers throughout, so this is your warning. I'm one for a good story. I think that you might be the start of one. The premise is simple enough. A group of seven heroes band together and overthrow the evil empire, freeing the people and becoming legends in the process. It's a bit generic and has been told to death, but it's not a bad foundation to start off with, and if well executed, it can be more than the sum of its parts. The show itself feels a little insecure about this though, as there is meta commentary peppered throughout trying to convince the audience that what they are watching is actually something special. Two warriors who overcame all obstacles stacked against them, bound together by destiny, etc, etc. There's enough of a seed there to grow a powerful story that the peasants can latch onto. Instead of convincing the audience of the merit of the story by telling the best version of this kind of story, they instead try to take the easy route and constantly tell the audience how great the story is, hoping that they will accept this as a fact through osmosis. Wow, that's very different. <laughs> This is really fun. The pacing of the story is also all over the place. A ton of the big story elements feel rushed to the point that the audience doesn't have time to care or get invested because the show has already moved on to the next thing. Moments that have a massive impact on the trajectory of the story leave little impression with the audience because they are yada yada. For instance, when Murrin betrays her brother and kills all of the monarchies, in a better told story, that could have been such a memorable moment. It's a moment that should have been built up over the course of a season, letting the audience understand the competing ideologies between Merwin and her brother, as well as fleshing out what the world would look like after the proposed treaty. But in Blood Origin, the coup comes so early that we have no real understanding of the players or their differing opinions. In the moment, we don't understand anyone's motivations for the coup, and the aftermath of this event makes 
makes no sense. The point of the treaty was to end the war and create peace between the kingdoms. Aridin explains that the armies wanted to keep fighting, so they killed the monarchies and the clans. Except, they still create peace, and the fighting between the countries ends as they all form under one empire. So if the militaries wanted to keep fighting, why did they support this coup? For being perhaps the most critical moment in the entire show, and the inciting incident, it really isn't well thought out. And it feels like the only reason anyone is on board with this is because the plot demands that it happens. A similar instance of rushed pacing is with Fjall and Merwin's love affair. We have just met these two characters, and then they start instantly hooking up. We are told that they have liked each other for a long time, but because we have not seen that dynamic, this massive step means nothing to us. We also don't know why such a relationship is taboo. There is no build up or context for the audience to be invested in what is happening. They are also immediately caught, making the scene feel silly and that its only purpose was to get Fial banished and to propel the plot forward. Adding to the pacing troubles is the fact that the show takes the most random asides to focus on and devote time to. It'll rush through the biggest most important moments, paying little mind to the characters motivations or any build up, and then bring the show to a screeching halt as they zero in on a conversation between two characters who we don't care about, talking about something that doesn't matter. I think this is their attempt to flesh out some of the tertiary characters, but it is not done in an interesting way nor does it really make them three dimensional. A lot of the show just feels kind of lazily written. They reuse the same line not to place an emphasis on something but simply because they couldn't be bothered to take a second longer to rephrase something. I thought that I was done with killing. Seems that killing isn't done with me. Meldorf was done with the world of elves. But the world of elves was far from done with her. A lot of the dialogue feels out of place or generic and adds to the lifelessness of the show. You're telling me that the first version of a witcher was a badass elf. And speaking of dialogue, I think now is a good time to highlight something that completely caught me off guard, and that is the use of swearing throughout the show. And fuck the fucking fuck off! Now, I enjoy myself a good F-bomb, just like anybody else. And I really like that streaming platforms like Netflix aren't restricted the same way traditional TV networks have been in the past. I always found it frustrating when a character would say frick or heck because of the limitations of television. Why can't I say fork? If you're trying to curse, you can't hear. I guess a lot of people in this neighborhood don't like it, so it's prohibited. That's bullshit. It's like, we all know what they wanted to say, and it's so unsatisfying when they break out a frick instead of what they actually mean. With that said, Blood Origin takes this to the extreme. Admittedly, in the first season of The Witcher, I really enjoyed Henry Cavill's resigned delivery of Fuck. However, the use of profanity in Blood Origin borders on parody. I found myself thinking of the South Park episode, where they say shit as many times as possible. By my count, the word fuck is uttered 47 different times throughout the four episodes. That is not even counting all of the other swear words said in the show. Ignoring the quantity of profanity, the actual instances when it is used are oftentimes jarring. They can sometimes undercut a serious moment or be said in a way that feels ridiculous. It would be one thing if the excessive swearing was a fun personality quirk for one of the characters, but it's not. Seemingly everyone talks the same, dropping f-bombs every second sentence. I'm not anti-swearing by any means, I just think that the way it was used in the show was poorly handled. Swearing can be fun, but doing it all the time causes a lot of problems. We have to go back to only using curse words in rare, extreme circumstances. And besides, too much use of a dirty word takes away from its impact. The show also introduces story elements that have nothing to do with the main plot line and serve to do little more than pad the runtime. For instance, when we were first introduced to Meldorf, she's on her own little side quest to avenge her lover and kill an elf. When I was first watching this, I assumed that the elf she was hunting would come back and be someone important and a member of the new empire, giving Meldorf a reason to join the party and attack the castle. The Seven would be her vehicle for revenge, and it would also mean that the time we spent with her on her hunt would tie back into the main plot. Turns out though that the elf she was hunting was just some guy, and had nothing to do with the rest of the story. It feels entirely like an afterthought and a waste of time. Her motivation for joining the fight against the empire is because she has nothing left to live for and wants to die in a place 
blaze of glory. This not only feels like a much weaker motivation, but that they really had no idea what to do with her character at all. The tale is about the seven, and so we need seven of them. Even if most of them have nothing to do, aren't fleshed out at all, and have no relevance to the plot. It has been reported that originally the show was going to be six episodes long, and that they trimmed it down during post-production. I feel like this can definitely be felt, and is a likely cause for some of the pacing issues and plot inconsistencies. But first, they would have to get through the royal protectors, Dog Clan, and their greatest warrior, Fjall Stoneheart. Obviously, this is intrinsically linked with the story, but I felt that it was so egregious in the show that it deserved its own section. The show is essentially a story within a story, as it uses this framing device as an excuse to use narration throughout. The narration is often on the nose and heavy handed. As Ayla, Fjall, and Skian continued south towards Centrea to hunt down everyone behind the bloody coup, the three hunters had themselves become the hunted. Because the show does not take the time to build up the characters, their motivations, and the events that are transpiring, they use the narration as a cheat code to tell the audience what is happening and how they are supposed to be feeling. Narration is not inherently a bad thing and can be used well as a means of world building and delivering necessary exposition. But if it is misused, it can come off as lazy and a narrative crutch. Through the narration and using characters as their mouthpieces, the show tells the audience how they should be perceiving things because they did not do a good job showing us. They insist that the Seven are special and a big deal. Gwen said there was something special about you lot. Your exploits are becoming more famous than your songs. They have the Empire quaking in their boots over a resistance of two people, when the reality is that they likely wouldn't even care. They also tell us how the exploits of the party are known by all of the common born and they are essentially becoming celebrities. They talk about how the Lark in particular is known by all, and her song is sweeping across the nation as the newest hit single. They show the tiniest bit of this in the intro when she is playing at a tavern and the people seem to enjoy it, but for how global she seems to be, more has needed to be done. Perhaps the worst example of show don't tell is the case of Sindril. We first see Sindril locked away in an elf prison, and Balor comes to gloat. He has the book of Amun-Ra with him, but he is alone and locked away in an anti-magic room. The next time we see him, he is in the swampland with his adopted sister. How did he escape, you ask? Doesn't matter. He gives an off-handed remark about how he used one of the monoliths, but that doesn't explain how he got out of his cell. Force a gateway and jump straight inside the palace courtyard. That's how I got here. His escape is honestly so jarring that I was doubting if I had somehow missed a scene. The fact that the show thinks this throwaway line is all they need to do to explain how Sindril escaped tells you all you need to know about the quality of writing in the show. What, are we some kind of suicide squad? The characters feel forgettable and have little to offer in way of meaningful interactions or development. The members of the Seven themselves don't feel too dissimilar from the Suicide Squad as most of them are given little to do and are little more than an afterthought. They each have their own little gimmick but lack any real substance. Also, I feel like I should mention that even though all of the characters are elves, save for Meldorf, they feel identical to humans. They act, look, and feel exactly like their human counterparts, the only difference being that they have pointy ears. I think this is a flaw as their elven heritage should make them distinct and give the show an altogether different feel. Another thing that the show struggles with is giving any of the characters compelling motivations. Some of them like Ayla and Fjall have the most basic of motivations like revenge which is easy enough to understand if a little toothless. However most of the other characters seemingly just do things at random or for the most surface level reasons. The interactions and relationships between characters also feel rushed and underdeveloped. This can be especially frustrating as these dynamics can often have big plot implications, leaving the audience scratching their heads as they were not shown the supposedly close bonds. For instance, apparently Fenric is the most important person in Balor's life, to the point that she is his ultimate sacrifice in order for him to gain chaos magic. However, this rings very hollow because we barely saw any of their relationship to the point that Fenric being super important to Balor feels like it came out of left field. It doesn't help that Balor doesn't actually seem to have an issue sacrificing Fenric as he does it pretty nonchalantly. We have almost no understanding of their relationship to the point where it feels jarring that she is supposedly important to him. We are not shown how she is important to him, we are simply told that that is the case. I do want to say though that I think all of the performances are actually pretty solid. 
solid. The material they were given to work with wasn't very good, but you can tell that the actors are giving it their all and trying to make something good. I feel bad for them because for a lot of them this was their big break and they were really excited to be part of the Witcher universe. For most of us this is like one of the biggest and best things that we've done in our career so far and I think we're all just so excited to be part of it. And unfortunately they found themselves in a show that is almost universally maligned. I also want to highlight my favorite character in the show, Elf Michael Sarah. He is exactly like Michael Sarah, except he's an elf. Master Avalok, are you ready? Right, it's up to me now. I'm Mr. Manager. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not too bad. I mean, it should be okay. I'm not too worried about it. You're perfect. Hi, I was thinking about asking you out, but then I realized how stupid that would be. Thief! You through, big man? Shall we make this quick or interesting? I know you're a big fish, but you're not gonna snap my line, okay? I'm hanging on tight. You wanna get off me? He does! I don't know why, but I really enjoyed when he was on screen, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in The Witcher proper. Like I mentioned previously, the show is supposed to contain six episodes, and I think this adds to the rushed feeling and unfinished quality of the show. I think this can also be seen in some of the special effects, as the scene where the beast is zapping the king and his peeps looks pretty bad, as well as Fial's transformation into the Marshmallow Man. I would just think that a show using the Witcher's IP would have the necessary funds to make these things look better than they actually do. I also wanted to take the time to highlight a few things that I found kind of funny. I like how in Fial's dream sequence, he ended up chugging more blood than a Rondir ever did. I also thought it was kind of funny how Aerodin just finds a skull and his first instinct is to wear it as a mask. He was giving me major Doctor Doom vibes from that Fan 4 stick movie. Wait, what? It's safe to say that faith in Netflix's Witcher adaptations is at an all-time low. Moving forward, winning back the trust of the audience will be a major challenge. With the loss of Henry Cavill to Superman, I... Uh, I mean Warhammer 40k, there will be a massive void that needs to be filled and I'm not sure if his replacement, Liam Hemsworth, will be able to fill it, regardless of the performance he gives. As for Blood Origin, it feels like a half-baked show that probably should not have been made in the first place. It doesn't feel like the fans were asking for this to be made, and judging from the final product, it doesn't seem like the showrunners were all too invested in it either. Blood Origin is a bad show, because it is rushed and breaks some of the most basic rules of storytelling. Most of the enjoyment I got from the show was Pokemon fun at it as I watched it with friends. As to whether or not it deserves to be Netflix's lowest rated original, I feel like that's probably a bit harsh. I've watched some shows on Netflix that I think are far worse, and I think some of the ratings were less to do with the show itself and more to do with the overall dissatisfaction with the handling of the Witcher IP. So the question of if I would rate Witcher Blood Origin higher than the 13% or low one it currently has, the answer is yes. I would rate it higher. To me, it's a high 2 out of 10. If you made it to the end of the video, I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, it would mean a lot if you liked and subscribed. I know the video was pretty negative as I honestly don't think Blood Origin was a very good show, but I hope it was not so much an angry rant and more so poking fun at some subpar media. I feel like a lot of the current discourse on YouTube surrounding TV and film is exceedingly negative and breeds toxicity. That's not to say that I myself don't enjoy a good old fashioned takedown of a piece of media, only that I don't want to become one of those channels where every single video they put out is a negative hate piece that sensationalizes things for views. In the future, I will still make videos being critical of a show or movie, but I want to highlight things I enjoy in media, just as much as the things that I don't like. I'm sorry if this is a bit rambly, but I just feel the need to mention it. As always, thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.